Good evening, everyone, and welcome to St. James Presbyterian Church here in the village of Harlem in the city of New York. And we are going to have our Bible study for Sunday, July 3rd, 2022, mm. um, our 14th Sunday in Ordinary Time. And we are so grateful that you are with us today. And if you join us on YouTube, please do leave comments and let us know if you have questions or thoughts about your thoughts on these scriptures and our thoughts on these scriptures as well. And don't forget to tune in on Sundays to our worship service where you can hear how these, how these scriptures play out in our liturgy and in our preaching and in our music. You can go to www.stjamesharlemnyc.org where you will see the Zoom link right there on the front page where you can also scroll down and donate to St. James. Let us move forward with our Bible study. As we were saying earlier, um, before we logged on here and before I edited that part out, um, we are going to talk about um, this psalm, which is a praise for deliverance. We have been in reading Psalms of Lament for many, many weeks now, so it is good to be in praise. But there is a metaphor system that goes throughout this particular psalm. It's a thanksgiving, um, it's a thanksgiving with a persistent metaphor system that you can hear all throughout the psalm. There is a going down, death and silence, then a rising up, life and praise. So you will hear that the metaphor of going down, death and silence, and then the rising up, life and praise a few times um, as, a, as a metaphoric um, cycle in this particular psalm. And the divine names that are listed in here, Lord and God, are listed 12 times to think that the tribes of Israel, uh, think of the tribe of Israel, suggesting healing is a type of what God does for all tribes. That's what we're thinking about here. So it says... I will extol you, O Lord, for you have drawn me up and did not let my foes rejoice over me. Lord, O Lord, my God, I cried to you for help and you have healed me. O Lord, you brought me up from shale, restored me to life from among those gone down in the pit. Uh, sing praises to the Lord, O you, his, his faithful ones, and give thanks to his holy name. For his anger is but for a moment, his, pray, his favor is for a lifetime. Weeping may linger for the night, but joy comes with the morning. Amen. As for me, I said in my prosperity, I shall never be moved. By your favor, O Lord, you had established me as a strong mountain. You hid your face. I was dismayed. To you I cried. O oh Lord, and to the Lord I made supplication. What profit is there in my death if I go down to the pit? Will the dust praise you? Will it tell of your faithfulness? Hear, O oh Lord, and be gracious to me. O oh Lord, be my helper. You have turned my mourning into dancing. You have taken off my sackcloth and clothed me with joy so that my soul may praise you and not be silent. O oh Lord, my God, I will give thanks to you forever. Amen. Oh, I like that song. Amen, it's beautiful. I like that song, I like that song. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I also like that metaphor that they speak of. Mm -hmm. What am I trying to do? Oh, I can cancel that. That's a beautiful metaphor. Um, the language, wait, what does it say? Lord, you have brought me up from, from Sheol. The language of death and recovery is used by people who were saved from God, by God, from life-threatening um, problems. So it's like when the Lord brought me through, it's the same kind of language. And of course, Sheol is the pit, or, and the pit is the abode of the dead. Um, neither heaven nor hell, but just an abode, a place where the dead reside, um, a place where there's an agreement that God will not go. But of course, all psalmists and others extol the fact that God loves us so much that God breaks that convention and goes down into Sheol to greet us, which I love. Um, this is something I never thought about before. This verse, verses six, verse number six, um, 
I used to think that it would, it, you know, because we sing the song, I shall not be moved just like a tree planted by the river. But that is not an allusion to this particular scripture. This particular scripture is about, is a smugness that preceded the crisis. And this withdrawal of divine support is what led to the collapse. So this person has come to believe after the joy comes in the morning that when they were in their prosperity, they gave them their, they, they gave them own, their own selves the power to say, I shall never be moved. Not like with God's help, I shall never be moved. And because they took that upon themselves, this is where the collapse comes. Because by your favor, O Lord, you established me as a strong mountain. But then when I, with this smugness, said it was in my prosperity, you hid your face from me. And I was dismayed. And then I cried to you and I made my supplication. And as I was going down, I said, made that, that there's a theme in many Psalms that God should save the psalmist because the dead do not praise God. And that's common in the Psalms as found in Psalm 6, number 5. So this whole idea is what profit is there in my death if I go down to the pit? Will the dust praise you? Will it tell of your faithfulness? Hear, O Lord, and be gracious unto me. And because God listens and God hears, mourning turns into dancing. The psalmist takes off the clothes of mourning and begins to throw on the clothes of dancing and joy and dances with joy. So therefore there's that praise again, so that my soul may praise you and not be silent. And I will give thanks to you, O Lord, forever. So I hope that you did see those three metaphors, those, metaphor, those double sets of metaphors throughout, um, of going down, death, silence, rising up, life, praise. And when we get too smug with ourselves, how God reminds us that you can go down to the pit too. <laughs> Do not leave me out of this equation. And thanks be to God, when we cry out to God to be our help and our strength. You think because of God, God is right still there. talking? God is right there. So, uh, the pond is in a star is in a store right now. I'm going to let her unmute herself later. So, any thoughts or ideas about this particular psalm, Linda? You seem to really love the the beauty of the flow mm -hmm. of this particular psalm. I do. I do. I think it's very. Um, it rejuvenates and it reminds us of our great responsibility to, you know, understand that his favor does come with, um, you know, with mindfulness of what he has given you. And that even though we get frustrated and uh, we cry out to God for help because we don't know which way to go, he always steps in. It just reminds me that he is always an on time God and, he doesn't, it doesn't mean that because you have his favor that, um, you know, that you will always see, you know, what you'd like to see come to fruition. And that, you know, if you take it for granted, no, he corrects us, mm -hmm. he corrects all of us, but we are, but I believe that in this psalm, um, um, very clearly it says even the correction is something to celebrate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Even this correction. Yeah. But it's very beautiful. And of course, it reminds me when he says, turn your morning into dance, reminds me of Ty Trivet. <laughs> That's why I started thinking go. about Ty Trivet, if you know his song. Yeah, I do, I do. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then, and, of course, there's this, this revised new standard version that says, um, um, weeping may linger for the night, but joy comes yes. with the morning. And most of us know that as what? Weeping may what for the night? We endure for, for, for a night yeah <laughs> endure comes in the morning yeah. yeah i have a question for you all that i'd like for you to think about while you're still thinking about your responses to this psalm and this is just sort of a roundabout thing to sort of say out loud what is the purpose or what how important is praise in this formula um for god to to work and continue to work with us. What is the power of this praise? Hmm. 
Or why is praise important? Is it because God is egotistical? I think praise, um, praise allows our body and mouth to affirm his miracles and his greatness in, his, in our lives. That's what praise does. It is the, the physical part of, of your expression for God to me. It's, it's, it's an action. It's a verb. So it's, it is, you know, it can be a noun, but to me, when in this, it speaks of it in activity, that you sing it to him if you are faithful to him and you give thanks you give thanks to his name and all things that you do you know um always in your mind connects to the praise of what god has done for you oh yeah an action word it's a verb mm -hmm. i see that ruling elder bradford has unmuted <laughs> Um, yeah, yes, I, I agree. I agree with what Linda said. Also, I, I noticed that it's um, praise is also the 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 default uh, expression. So, you know, you've drawn me up. I praise you. You let my foes rejoice over me. I praise you. Uh, I cried to you for help. You heal me. I praise you so that there is there is a constant end result to the uh, quote negative um, to then always come back to um, yes, all of what is happening, all of what I experience or what we experience um, is for a reason. And that thanks is thanks and praise um, are where we have to stay in order to, to keep from being uh, taken down the shale, for example, mm -hmm. or going down to the pit that that praise is what redeems us and what allows us to continue without having this uh, weeping, enduring, you know, for the night and knowing that joy, praise, Thanksgiving comes in the morning. That's that's just what I took from it. Okay. Andrea, I would like to ask you something because I've been trying to think about this while you were speaking and I can't come up with anything because I was listening to you. Um, what's can you give me a familiar call and response spiritual? For? Just an example of one, just any. Call and response. I had one, but it left my brain. Or anybody. Um, there's a song that I know, this is what I was thinking of. There's a song that goes, Jesus on the main line. Tell him what you want. Jesus on the main line. Tell him what you want. Jesus on the main line. Tell him what you want. Tell him what, Tell you, him what want. you want. Da, da. So this Jesus being on the main line, I think of I think of this praise and this in this metaphor is either silence or praise right in this metaphor and i think of that in a way for us to maybe even think about it um and this is coming to me right now is also as a call and response in a way of being in conversation with god it's sort of like if god is doing something and there's silence there's no recognition that you appreciate it that you know it or that you are ex or happy about it but when you praise it is the response to god's call on your life so I like to think of the African American spiritual call and response in connection mm -hmm. to this silence versus praise. Because mm -hmm. if you say Jesus on the main line and it's silent, you're mm -hmm. gonna be like, um. But when you have that joining in of the response, mm -hmm. all of a sudden, you know, the congregation and the community joining <laughs> in starts to build up this joyous praise. Mm -hmm. And this acknowledgement that God, um, that you can give, call God and give God everything that you want. Mm -hmm. So I was just thinking about that in terms of silence versus praise as 
what would happen if every call and response song, we did all this calling, but there was no response. <laughs> Mm. So I was just meaning that the meaning that the response is um, God's praise. That regardless it, of it, what the call is, the call is the script. The the psalm reinforces that whatever the call is, our response should always be God's praise. And it's also a thank you. You know, it's like a recognition. Mm -hmm. Nobody likes to be ignored, mm -hmm. much less God. Right? <laughs> yes. I mean, how many right. times have you done something you say, gosh, they could have at least said thank you? <laughs> yeah. Right, right. I know right. Sister Thelma has to deal with that all the time in her job. <laughs> Absolutely. You're writing up reports and giving out things to people, and they just, okay, okay, okay. It's like you could at least say thank you. All day, every day. But. <laughs> Because I say you're welcome, whether they say thank you or not. Right, that, right. Yeah. Right, yeah. right. <laughs> so that's the sort of thing that I was thinking about, how we can sort of be in this call and response and in this acknowledgement of what God is doing with us with the praise rather than in silence. Mm -hmm. And that would be my argument to say amen in churches that say that you shouldn't say amen. Well, what churches are they? Oh, Linda, there are certain Presbyterian churches that I've been to that have actually had a vote over whether or not you should clap or say amen. Oh, no. Oh, my gosh. Well, what else would, are you going to do? So well, what do you do? You just say um, it. Well, as they yeah. voted and informed the congregation, you can say one amen. Oh. <laughs> one. Oh, my gosh. When I heard about that, I was like, are y'all serious? And then I think I went there and I sang Precious Lord and people started crying and it was like that went out the window. <laughs> but they couldn't say amen. I know, right? <laughs> right? Cry. Cry. Actually, they said amen and they clapped. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. And that's how I found out about the rule. <laughs> oh my goodness. That is so. Well, I think there's so many traditions. Right. You know, that there is, um, you're not supposed to respond mm -hmm. when, you're, when you're in the pew kind of thing. Right. Um, hmm. uh, you just, you're not, I mean, it's just the culture that you just don't respond. I know a lot of people that will come to, to our church, St. James, mm -hmm. and they will say, I've never heard people say, talk so much and, and pray and, and be so happy in church in a, in a visual way and in a physical way. Um, you know, in my church, we just sit and, you know, say nothing. Uh, the every, Catholic, every European says that when they come exactly, here. <laughs> exactly. I mean, Catholic church, for example, you stand yeah, when yeah. you're supposed to stand, yeah. you sit down when you're supposed to yeah, down, you kneel yeah. when you're supposed to kneel, yeah. but nobody yeah. says That's anything other yeah, than yeah, that. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah. One of my very close girlfriend's son got married and, and she was Catholic in uh Kennedy courthouse and, uh, and uh, you know when they did the service, I had she sat next to me. I said, like, "Can I say amen?" No, Linda. It's like now, no. Right. <laughs> How about now? No. Right. I said, right. What? Right. <laughs> but you know, it was funny because I, you know, I it was they they just laughed their heads off at me. This, I mean, they just laughed. Yeah. So I said, we have different churches. That's all. But the beautiful, but the beautiful thing about this, in ter in terms of embracing all traditions, is that God does call us to respond, um, and to praise. And I, and this is how I learned how to preach. I grew up Baptist, so I grew up in all the amens and everything. But I learned how to preach, and I and I started preaching in a Presbyterian church. And I would preach in a Presbyterian church. And Linda, you know, I preached at Macedonia and oh, I get all of yeah, yeah. And then oh, I, preach at, and I preach at other Presbyterian and I preached at, oh. at First Pres, right? Yeah, yeah. And it would be like crickets, crickets. But the response would be people coming to you when they're walking out saying, you changed my life by how I heard God speaking to me. Yep. That response is just <laughs> as valid as someone getting up and shouting in the aisles. Yep. Okay. You know what I mean? So, and yeah. the fact, and that was the thing, the beautiful thing about the 
quote unquote traditional and contemporary service was that in between with coffee hour, you could sit there and watch somebody that was just as still and watch someone that was saying amen all the time. And you recognize that you all had your own different way of responding and praising. Mm. That was the beautiful part of it. And that's mm. where I learned that it's not, it's not about the, I don't need the affirmation of the amen. I don't need that and blah, 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 because I know that God, res that people respond to God in their lives and that they praise God in their own way. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I would like to see I would like to see that that script flipped and see the quiet ones come and allow to express their their mm -hmm. spirituality. And then I would like to see all of us who are so animated <laughs> to quiet ours down and just sit and have and each one have a different experience just to see what that would feel like. And, you know, and what what new dimension that might bring. I think it's kind of speaking, interesting. I was speaking with yeah. a very young African American woman who's a who was just ordained and she has these a new congregation she's building and she has this church in Delaware um, in order to make a full time call. And we were talking um, about the, the idea, and this has happened to me before. One of the things, and I think some of you may have experienced this, that's really powerful is when right after the preaching, you say now that we have heard the sermon, do you have any thoughts or any questions or ideas that you'd like to talk about? And you have a talk back right after the sermon. Hmm. I like that. It's really, I was scared to no end the first time I knew I had to do that. Mm -hmm. I was so mm -hmm. afraid. Because of course you're going to think that people are gonna, just going to criticize you or whatever, right? Mm. But people are very intrigued because they're listening and they're taking the scripture and the, what you're saying, and then they're trying to process how they're hearing it, and they're talking with you, and it's a great conversation. Right. So I like Linda, that. Linda, that's a great compromise sometimes, too. Oh, it is. To have a oh, talk is. back after the sermon mm -hmm. about what did you hear? Um, our minister this past week, who was Ricky Faison, I think you might know Ricky, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and he, he's been in for us for a couple of times, actually the last two, three times. And he said something that really intrigued me um, that would have been perfect for that. And he just said, you know, how many of you might be participating in what I call sermon sipping? So, <laughs> oh, you know what I mean by sermon sipping? Yes, he I went do. into it a little bit and I thought, oh, that would have been a perfect, you know, can we go deeper into that? Can you just, yeah. I mean, I, I'd never thought about that concept. I'd never delved into it. Um, but I certainly have been guilty of it. <laughs> so, 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 you know, I just, I mean, I just, you know, that would have been a perfect opportunity to say, what do you mean by that? Mm. You know? Wow. That's yeah. Deep. Yeah. That's deep. Yeah. I'm and still I thinking think, it through. And I think it's, um, it's also, different um in the south mm -hmm. and in a lot of southern churches particularly black predominantly black churches in the south that have certain traditions um there are also black churches in the south that have traditions that are not like say primitive baptist churches um but that they are united methodist churches yeah or they're Episcopal churches. There are a lot of Anglican slash Episcopal folks, black folk, in mm -hmm. the South. and that's completely that that sort of feeds right out of the Catholic tradition. And then the generations, like my mother, would never say Amen in a service. I mean, she just wouldn't. Mine either. That's not what yep. you do. You uh, know, no, mine either. Nope, mine didn't either. You she was a I would either. Yep. Right. Nope, I not, I've never heard my mother say amen. Exactly. Never. exactly. And Derek, you knew my mother. I know, Aunt Ruth, not, I never she, remember. Because nope. she was raised Episcopal. And they, right, they, right, they, right. they, so they don't. And That's so right. I've never, ever heard her say amen. Never. Right, right. No, never. And right. and she often told us to sit down and be quiet. Yes, exactly. Oh, yeah. Exactly. I remember Aunt Ruth looked, turned her face to skew at a couple of people poking those lips out. That's right. Sit down <laughs> and stifle. <laughs> yeah. Shut but, up. You know, yeah. it's the way she, you know, her, her original um, denomination was Episcopal. Yeah. And then she asked to, you know, my, my father was Baptist and she asked to turn over, but she never changed. She just sat and that's just who she was. Never changed it. Right. Yeah. You're right about that. And I mean, that's the, the way we <laughs> see it, but, um, 
Mm. But, you know, uh, yeah, it's very interesting indeed. And really I think that the, the lesson in all of this is to, is to really evaluate what our own praise and thanks looks like. Yeah. And to own mm -hmm. that and to know that that's part of our, once again, our relationship with God and our conversation with God. Mm -hmm. You know, um, it's very interesting to know that, you know, I can go on YouTube and watch, you know, you can go to YouTube and watch another service and sort of like you won't, you, many times you won't be shouting amen to the screen, but many times you'll sit back and you, you'll, re, you'll rewind it and say, hmm, let me think about that point. Mm -hmm. And your response is your interaction with it. And I think that right. that has a lot to do with praise as well. Mm -hmm. So let us move to our second mm -hmm. thing. Mm -hmm. um, thank you for that conversation. I enjoyed that. <laughs> um, Very nice. This is a wonderful story in Second Kings that teaches that the Lord is not only God of Israelites, but, God, but the God of foreigners. Mm -hmm. And if you, if you can see my notes, it's very interesting because the person who wrote the commentary did this on purpose with the word God. Mm -hmm. That the Lord is not only God of Israelites, but God of foreigners. Because the foreigners will look at your God as a small g and say, this is just another one of the deities that people are thinking about. Yeah. But we'll, sh we'll see how that shifts in this particular scripture. 2 Kings 5 verses 1 through 15. Naaman, commander of the army of the king of Aram, was a great man and in high favor with his master, because by him the Lord had given victory to Aram. The man, though a mighty warrior, suffered from leprosy. Now the Arameans, on one of their raids, had taken a young girl captive from the land of Israel, and she served Naaman's wife. She said to her mistress, if only my Lord were with the prophet who was in Samaria, he would cure him of, le of his leprosy. So Naaman went in and told his Lord just what the girl from the land of Israel had said. And the king of Aram said, go then, and I will send, a send along a letter to the king of Israel. He went, taking with him 10 talents of silver, 6,000 shekels of gold, and 10 sets of garments. He brought the letter to the king of Israel, which read, when this letter reaches you, know that I have sent to you my servant Naaman, that you may cure him of his leprosy. And when the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his clothes and said, am I God to give life or death, that this man sends word to me to cure a man of his leprosy? Just look and see how he was trying to pick a quarrel with me. But when Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes, he sent a message to the king. Why have you torn your clothes? Let him come to me, that he may learn that there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman came with his horses and chariots and halted at the entrance of Elisha's house. Elisha sent a messenger to him saying, Go wash in the Jordan seven times and your flesh shall be restored to you and you shall be clean. <laughs> but Naaman became angry and went away, saying, I thought that for me he would surely come out and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and would wave his hand over the spot and cure the leprosy. Are not Abana and Far -far Farpar, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? Could I not wash in them and be clean? He then turned and went away in a rage. But his servants approached and said to him, Father, if the prophet had commanded you to do something difficult, would you not have done it? How much more when all he said to you was wash and be clean? So he went down and immersed himself seven times in the Jordan, according to the word of the man of God. His flesh was restored like the flesh of a young boy, and he was clean. Then he returned to the man of God and all his company. He came and stood before him and said, 
now I know that there is no God in all the earth except in Israel. Please accept a present from your servant. So that idea that in the very beginning that the Lord is not only the God of Israelis, but the God of foreigners turns into this monotheistic pledge of Naaman, this confession, which reminds us of Rahab's confession. If you remember Rahab, she was the prostitute that lived in the wall. Mm -hmm. Spies came to. And she wrote this, she said this, as soon as we heard it, our hearts failed and there was no courage left in any of us because of you. The Lord your God is indeed God in heaven above and on earth below. The Lord is not only the God of Israel, but of all the earth. So this confession that we hear in Rahab is once again repeated here in 2 Kings. Let's just go through this a little bit and just get a little... Um, so the name Naaman actually means gracious. It's a proper name as well as an epithet of royal personages. So it's also sort of like a title. He suffered from leprosy. This is an important note because most of the time when we hear about people with leprosy, we assume of these people of leprosy that, are, that cannot be near their community, that they are so ill that they have to go to the temple to be cleansed, so on and so forth, but yet, Apparently, this leprosy was not contagious as it did not exclude him from society. <laughs> Elisha is in Samaria. Elisha is not with those other prophet communities. Do you remember last week when mm -hmm. he, would, he, was go, he was walking with Elijah and they were walking by one place and he said, don't you know that your master is about to be taken up? He said, be quiet, I know. Don't you know that your master is about to be taken up in another prophet, another community of prophets? Well, he is in Samaria alone. And this means that those, those particular prophets were pretty much in the southern kingdom. Remember that the kingdom split? So the southern kingdom is where they still call, say that God resides in Jerusalem. The northern kingdom is where they say that God resides in one of the mountains and where they worship God. And this is, this is Samaria. And this is why Samaritans and Jews never got along in the time of Jesus. Because they always believed that God should be praised and worshiped in the mountain and that God was not in the temple in Jerusalem. That was the main issue between them. But he is now living in Samaria in this point of Israelite history. So there are two Israels. And, the, and Samaria is the capital of the northern kingdom. So he's not with those other ones. And I looked it up and because I thought it was very fascinating that Elisha is called the man of God. He's separated out from those other prophets, those other group of prophets. Like we said last week, like we said in the sermon on Sunday, you know, they all wanted to be the next main prophet. But this one is known as the man of God. So he is God's representative. And those other prophets are just other prophets. And if you remember when we talk about Jesus and saying that he's the Messiah, that there were all these other people claiming that they were Messiahs, that we have historically, uh, we have historic records of people saying that I'm the Messiah, I'm the Messiah, but Jesus is the son of God. So this, this phraseology, man of God, was very intriguing to me when I was doing the Bible research today. And I was very fascinated to realize that because he is the sole prophet now in Samaria, he is the one that is claiming and calling out God's will, and he is the representative of God. So here now, this, this, this treasure that he takes to the king. So 10 talents of silver is 755 pounds of silver. 6,000 shekels of gold is 150 pounds of gold. Wow. So this is a huge, and 10 sets mm -hmm. of gold, probably made of silk or whatever it is, or however it was made, but, and purple. <laughs> but this is really a huge, huge gift for the king of Israel, if you can cure my leprosy. Mm -hmm. The king has no understanding that the little slave girl has talked about Elisha and that this is just a letter of introduction to Elisha. 
So he thinks that he's being tested because Naaman is so powerful and his reputation is so well known as being such a great leader that he is tempting him to say that if you can't cure my leprosy, then we will declare war on you. So he's freaking out. He rips his clothes in sackcloth. He rips his clothes in grief. And Elisha's like, what you doing, man? <laughs> he's not here to see you. He's here to see me. Now, here we are once again. Um, Naaman, this powerful man, acquiesces and goes to this lowly prophet's house. But Elisha doesn't come out to greet him, as we heard the Naaman say. But this laconic, this response of a few words from Elisha to King Naaman to wash seven times was one of the biggest insults that he had ever heard. He could have, he thought that the power was in the washing not in the power of Elisha. What, what, one of the things I love about this particular scripture when we combine it with last week's scripture is what did Elijah do with his mantle? He touched the river Jordan and God opened it. What did Elisha do with his mantle? He touched the river Jordan and it opened. So if Elisha is telling you to wash in Jordan, you need to wash in the Jordan. <laughs> <laughs> because he knows that God has stirred the waters. And very often, um, just like the, the pool at Siloam, the, there's always thought that because people have been healed there, that the finger of God or the angel of God stirs the waters. And that whenever you see the ripple in the pool of Siloam, it means that God is touching the water for healing. So there is residual effect when the prophet tells you to do something from how God has touched the water, mm. which is why the Jordan is such a powerful, powerful phenomenon and source of water um, in our older Testament. And he has no idea of that. He just thinks about the beautiful, beautiful Aramean rivers, mm. those beautiful Aramean and the rivers of Damascus, a place he's conquered of Havana and Farpar these beautiful, bright, blue rivers. And from what we understand, the Jordan River ain't all that blue. <laughs> That's it's what muddy, it sounds like. It's a I'm muddy mess. That, that, it's a yeah, muddy that he, mess. Yeah, yeah. That's what it sounds like he's insulted because he knows better. Like he knows there are prettier pieces yeah. of fear. So why would he put me in this dirty water? And So even when we think back to the Egyptians in the Nile, you know, Pharaoh's daughter was not in the midst of the Nile. She was in a purified pool of the waters of the Nile because the Nile is, is a big mess. <laughs> it's all muddy down at the bottom with all the reeds and so on and so forth. Um, but then, you know, he gets so upset. But then his servants are like, they say father, and father is a, is a term of, as a title of respect. And the servants persuade him to res to reconsider his hasty interpretation. And isn't this the truth about us? When somebody tells us some way to do something the easy way, and we get all fussy about it and say, look, if somebody had told you to jump over a hoop and run through fire, wouldn't you have done that to make it happen? Mm. All the doctor told you to do was take two aspirin and call me in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> right. I need a third opinion. Uh. <laughs> yeah. And so he goes and he's cleaned. And not only, I love this idea of his flesh being restored like the flesh of a young boy. You have to remember he's also a warrior. Mm. So, as well as with the leprosy, you can imagine the scars on his body and for his flesh to be made anew must have been a miracle. Now I know that there is no God in all the earth. Now there is only one God, that monotheistic God. And I should have done 15A because please accept the present from your servant is a part of another story. Mm -hmm. 
So let's have a few moments to have a few of your thoughts on this particular story that we've heard today and it and in its explication that we've heard tonight from how we may have known this story before. Hmm. I think Naaman was he had to be, you know, I mean, he had to be he he basically had to have it proven. I mean, he was he was kind of went over because his 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 leprosy was taken away. So, you know, you think about that particular saying of, you know, sight unseen and having faith even though you can't see it. Mm -hmm. I don't know that he would have fallen into that range, but um but certainly he was persuaded once he saw the results. Then he came out and said, He is the God of all the earth, <laughs> but not before. That's what I kind of I don't know, sort of seeing him. And I and I think it's very interesting that he wanted to buy his way into, you know, to to health. That he also also remember that if he had taken, if he had raided Israel and has this and this little Israelite and Israeli girl as a slave and a servant, it means that there had been some hostility. So there's also a sense that, well, you know, this is really our apology and our, but he ain't bring the girl back. Right. <laughs> yeah. No reparations yeah. there, you know? Yeah. Well, yes, but Naaman was a warrior, a very successful, well thought of warrior. He was mm -hmm. used to approaching um, problems with force. Hmm. That's why the king had to write him a letter of introduction mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. from king yeah. to king. So to, to mm -hmm. imagine the, uh, the power of the word of, of being washed in the river, that was something that, that was an idea that was foreign to him. Mm -hmm. The gentleness of, be, of, of a wash. Ooh, you better go, girl. Go, girl. <laughs> the gentleness of a wash. I didn't think you had different types of leprosy. Yes, I'm Yeah, that, I know, that, that right? Could actually, you know, no one was running ahead of him saying unclean, unclean. Yeah. I was any of that. that. I thought it was strictly one and done. That's it. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? I thought that that was very interesting too, mm -hmm. Antoinette. I was like, "What? This man? Yeah, that, that, that's an eye opener to me." Mm -hmm. Yeah, I thought that that was very yeah. interesting myself. Um, and also, mm -hmm. I think one of the things I would also like to mention is how many other um, magicians and medicine men do you think he had gone to to cure this leprosy? Mm. Oh, all. He had access to the best of everything. And here is this man who doesn't come out to see him, but sends his servant. Which mm. shows him, this man is not humble. <laughs> so he and, must know, he must have something going for him that's as powerful as Naaman. And the other thing about this is like, certainly, what does he say? Certainly I thought that he would come out call on the name of the Lord his of his the Lord his God and would would wave his hand over the spot and cure the leprosy what has he heard about God the God of Israel he's heard about Elijah he's heard about the altar where the God of Baal and and of and the, how Elijah told those other prophets here built let's cut this bull in half I'll take half and put it on my altar you do yours and you call for your God to come down and to light this fire and we'll see whose God does what and then Elijah pours water all over his altar the sacrifice and says, God, please light this sacrifice and light this altar. This sacrifice is yours. And God just whoosh. So he's expecting something grand. Theatrical. But it's more like, Eli like Elijah's experience. He looked for God and, you know, it wasn't in the thunder. It wasn't in the earthquake. <laughs> it was in the gentle wash. <laughs> That's going to be a coin phrase, my dear. It may be a sermon title, right? I was going to say, it's going to come up this Sunday. It might be a sermon title. I know Reverend Pond is going to listen to the recording for that. Hmm, 
I love it. And I think the other part of that too is that he's thinking about really pretty rivers, you know, he's gonna, he wants to look like he's being washed by the best. So, mm -hmm. and so, and what, what is happening is that, um, you know, take two aspirin, call me in the morning. And by the way, that, that <laughs> river over there is, is plenty. It will do what I need it to do. And he's like, well, no, no, the other rivers are like full of flowers and they're clean and they're in Damascus. And, you know, so well, how come I can't go to those really pretty places? By the way, I can invite all my friends. They'll wear evening gowns and it will be a grand gesture as opposed to just doing, as Mary said, just the gentle, simple wash uh, in a dirty river that isn't so dirty that it's not curing your leprosy. It's like the country doctor and he's expecting the grand surgeon, exactly. you know, from the top, you know, hospital. Right, right. And I, and I That's like it. That's not even the country doctor. He, he, that was like the root guy. You want me to drink that COVID tea? Oh God, it tastes so bad. It smells bad. I can't right. do that. Right. 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 Must be another way. Gotta be another way. Besides, don't you know who I am? Right. Right. You, you know, you already done disrespected me, really? No. Nope. Don't be sending me down there to Georgia. <laughs> Don't be sending me down there. What? So there's there's this, I can tell you, I can give you sort of a little um, real life instance of this kind of an idea of what these beautiful waters that you think are going to calm you and the, and then the waters that are that nobody else really wants to go to. Linda, you will appreciate this. When you go to Cape May, you can go to Cape May's beach and it's really beautiful. Um, they clean it every night. Um, their lifeguard stands yes, all over the place. And it costs money. You have to get a beach tag. Yes, you do. And it's crowded. <laughs> yes, and there is. are a lot of people and there are a lot of kids and so on and so forth. But if you just drive a little bit past West Cape May and you turn left, and you get to the end of this road, this dead end road, there's this little parking lot. And you park your car in this dirt parking lot and you walk down this hot, sandy mm -hmm. path covered with, with green heads, which are flies that bite yep, you. Bite and you. All this other stuff in the sand and it opens up yep. into this oh, beautiful, 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 beautiful beach. waterways that's not as crowded but no. it's not as pristine, no. but it gives you a sense of joy and peace. Mm -hmm. It's the difference between Cape May Beach proper and Higby Beach. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Higby, yep, yep. No beach tag either. No beach tag either. Yep. It's free. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's quite different. You gotta get past the but horseshoe, horseshoe crabs yes, go in did. there. Yeah, 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 yeah. They gotta get past those flies too. Yes. Yeah. But there's but the, it is there, beautiful. But there's yeah. something beautiful about even when you walk in the dunes and you walk out over the dunes and you walk out and all of a sudden you see this beautiful waterways and you just roll down this hill of sand mm -hmm. and the water is inviting and warm and it's part by the Delaware Bay and it's just really beautiful. It is beautiful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's where I hang out. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So now let us go to Paul offering the Galatians maxims by which to judge their behavior. We are now near, we are now in the end of Paul's letter to the Galatians. Um, we've heard all of the works that he spoke last week, um, but now he's talking to them and wrapping things up. My friends, if anyone is detected in a transgression, you who have received the spirit, oh yes, Lord, should restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness. Yes. Take care that you yourselves are not tempted. Mm. Bear one another's burdens. And in this way, you will fulfill the law of Christ. For if those who are nothing think they are something, they deceive themselves. Yes. 
-hmm. all must test their own work, then that work, rather than the neighbor's work, will become a cause for pride. For all must carry their own loads. Those who are taught the word must share in all good things with their teacher. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For you reap whatever you sow. Mm -hmm. If you sow to your own flesh, you will reap corruption from the flesh. But if you sow to the spirit, you will reap eternal life from the spirit. So let us not grow weary in doing what is right. For, yes. for right, for we will reap at harvest time if we do not give up. Amen. So then, whenever we have an opportunity, go to the damn let us work for the good of all, and especially for those of the family of faith. Mm. See what large letters I make when I am writing in my own hand. <laughs> it is those who want to make a good showing in the flesh that try to compel you to be circumcised. Only that they may not be persecuted for the cross of Christ. <laughs> Even the circumcised do not themselves obey the law, but they want you to be circumcised so that they may boast about your flesh. <laughs> May I never boast of anything except the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. For neither the circumcision nor uncircumcision is anything, but a new creation oh, is everything. Mm. As for those who will follow this rule, peace be upon them and mercy and upon the Israel of God. Mm. Ooh, what a pericope. Oh, yes, that's a good one. What a pericope. Mm -hmm. um, so these are, this is what Paul is trying to have people to figure out how to judge your behavior. This whole idea of the law of Christ is possibly a phrase that Paul is borrowing from his opponents, this law idea. Um, because his opponents were so concerned that the Gentiles follow the law of the Torah, 1 Corinthians 9, 21, 8, 2, but it is the spirit that enables believers to live out the principles of love, thus fulfilling the law without observing its requirements, without going to the temple to make sacrifice, without having to circumcise yourself. It is the spirit that enables you to live out this principle of love. Mm -hmm. Yes, how beautiful. Oh, and this little thing about Christian teachers are entitled to support from their church, financial. That's what verse six means. Uh. <laughs> but of course, financial back then means feeding, housing, um, and, and sort of giving um, hospitality to, um, and helping and collecting offerings so that they can move forward to go teach in other places. Um, so let us not grow weary. Um, it's also translated as, so let us not lose heart and it's also spoken of in Luke 18 then Jesus told them a parable about the need to pray always and not lose heart family of faith literally members of the of a household of faith compared to Ephesians um, no longer strangers and aliens but you are members of a household of God this is the same kind of lang language that he's talking about also that's being talked about in Timothy um, how one ought to behave in the house, household of God, which is the church of the living God. And First Peter, um, for the time has come for judgment to begin with the household of God, it begins with us. So here, I want you to understand that um, I like this because we've talked a bit about how the, the pseudepigraphal writings, those were, that were done in the names of other people, those that were done in the name of Paul, done in the name of Peter, done in the name of John, um, that come from these different schools, they take these phrases that are familiar and redo them and reconstitute them. So this household of faith and household of God, even though Ephesians and, and Galatians are, are, are written by Paul, First Peter is not, and First Timothy most likely is not. So what they're saying is, people are using phrases of Paul to pull upon his authority. That's what's really beautiful about that. This, see what large letters I make when I'm writing in my own hands. Paul 
we, we believe that Paul dictated these letters to a secretary, but, it, but he writes the conclusions in his own hands. 1 Corinthians 16, 21, I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand. He does the same things in Philemon, or, uh, uh, oh no, not uh, in Thessalonians, Thessalonians 3:17. It, but it makes this, it, it gives this whole idea of his power and what he truly, truly believes and what he really wants to emphasize about ending his letter saying that this is coming from my heart. So I want you to know that my writing will be different. I'm writing in large letters so that you can see it, which may be where John Hancock say, I want to sign it big so that George, King George can read it without his glasses, you know? Um, but this whole idea is to let them know that I am really compelled to, to, so that you know that this is coming from me. Those who make a good showing in flesh that try to compel you to be circumcised are just trying to tack up numbers to say how many people that they have brought onto Christ and into the Jewish community. They want to boast about your flesh. They want to boast about your very body being brought into their fold. I don't want to boast about that. Flesh is also a double reference to circumcision and his opponent's pride in the success in their mission. And this blessing in verse 16 is just the first half of the blessing. As for those who will follow this rule, the blessing is peace will be upon you and mercy and upon the Israel of God. I love this particular scripture when I read it out loud. I love reading Paul out loud. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's very clear. Because you have to listen to it because it can get very confusing if you read it by, if you just read it rote, but if you follow the punctuation and you really listen to what's being said, the key to reading scripture um, and to reading it out loud in many cases, and when I teach liturgy, I tell people, and when I teach preaching, I say, you may write something down, you may read it a hundred times, but every time you speak it out loud, hear it for the first time. My friends, if anyone is detected in a transgression, you who have received the Spirit should restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness. I heard that today in a very new way with you all tonight. And it moved my heart and it made me read the really? rest of it in a totally different way. So I encourage you when you get to certain things that you read that, that really matter to you, read it out loud. Remember that these letters, especially of Paul, the Psalms were sung, they were read. These letters were read in community. They weren't just sit down, they weren't given a book. Someone carried a scroll and they met in this upper room or in this household and they said, here's the latest letter from Paul. Not everybody could read, so they said, let me read you what he said. Mm. These things are meant to be read out loud. We're not talking about communities that all could say, okay, well, give me the scroll and I'll read it for myself. It was meant to be read in community. It was meant to be read out loud and it was meant to be emphasized for the efficacy of your relationship with the community and with Christ. So I encourage you to do that. And if you find yourself speeding through it while you're reading it, here's a tip. When you get to a comma, take one beat. When you get to a period, take three. If you get to a semicolon, Take two, my friends, if anyone is detected in a transgression, you who have received the spirit should restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness. Take care that you yourselves are not tempted. Bear one another's burdens. Mm -hmm. This is especially important because when we're reading out loud and we're hearing it out loud, I don't care if you if you you have to give people the opportunity to process it. Mm -hmm. So we take our time with it. Mm -hmm. 
So that's just a little mm -hmm. bit of what I teach when I teach preaching and worship. <laughs> just a little tidbit. Um, any thoughts on this before we move on to our gospel? I think there are a lot of life lessons in there, a lot of things that still resonate today. Well, like I said, this, yeah. is, this whole chapter is Paul is offering these maxims by which people can judge their own behavior. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, the first thing I thought about was <clears throat> wearing of masks. Oh. And how people will criticize everybody else because they aren't wearing a mask. <laughs> but they sometimes don't think about the fact that they aren't really wearing a mask either mm -hmm. or they find ways not to wear a mask come on now <laughs> mm -hmm. um and my mother's a perfect example you know she she will go places and not wear her mask and criticize all the way up and down <laughs> why aren't they why don't they have their mask on <laughs> were, uh, you don't have one on because you said that you feel claustrophobic when you have it on so maybe they feel the same way i mean we go through this whole discussion but it's so interesting that you know, it's that was the first thing that came to mind when I. This is I, subways. Yeah, right. <laughs> and buses. And buses. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Keep the nose. Exactly. Exactly. Below the nose, right? Below the nose. Yeah. Anyway, that was. Oh, that was You're so name. right, Andrea. <laughs> and I love this because this is hard for us. This is such a great way for us to understand. And once again, Sister Riley. This is another iteration of the gentle wash. Yeah. Restores mm -hmm. one in a spirit of gentleness. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know? And this revives you mm -hmm. not to grow weary in doing what you do. Mm -hmm. We do grow weary, though. But <laughs> if we bear one another's burdens. We grow burdens, weary, though. We do. If we bear one another's burdens and in this way we fulfill the law of Christ, what's the law of Christ? Love one another. Love one another. Love one another. So if we bear one another's burdens, he's talking about we are loving one another, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. Mm -hmm. I love that. Do not be deceived, for God is not mocked. <laughs> mm -hmm. Read what you will say. We will grow weary. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we do. Mm -hmm. If we don't give up, we will reap. Right. Yes, we will reap. Mm -hmm. ah, mm. That's just good stuff. Oh, that's wow. That's oh, just wow. good stuff. And I love that. You better stop bragging. May I never brag of anything? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and and that, that is a very real thing, you all. It's sort of like... Um, how many members do you have at your church? How many people do you have coming through your doors? Mm -hmm. It's like, mm -hmm. I don't want to brag about the numbers of our churches. Mm -hmm. I just want to, I just want to brag about the, the glory of Christ crucified and God's grace. I want to boast about that. Mm -hmm. And for some, for so long, Linda, um, in our Presbyterian churches, we have this thing called apportionment. Mm -hmm. hmm. And apportionment is, um, monies that we offer up to pay for our our local presbytery our our general synod which is for us is the east coast north northeast coast and then for our national church they all have these little bits and it's a suggested donation that you give to them right oh. uh, it's one it's a set amount for every member oh so several churches for the longest time um especially um, in years past, they would say, oh, we have 300 members. And they would have to pay 300 times that apportionment. Oh, that, And then they yeah. would fall behind on that apportionment and wonder why people were questioning what's going on. Right, right, where's the money? And I think many of us have started to finally get over that by really honestly assessing 
you know, and of course, you know, there are other reasons people don't want to tell people that, are you, are you going to be part of our church again? Nobody really right. wants to have that conversation or even the, the, the conversation to say, we miss you. Have you found another home? You know, that mm. kind of thing. Um, there's a pastoral way to do that. But that, be, but that became very indicative of many of our churches. And I will say it just speaking for our presbytery, but I know it happens across the national church. So many people are so worried about their reputation that look, how many people do we have? Mm. Just like these people that are telling people you need to be circumcised <laughs> rather than being boast, boastful about Christ. So there's a lesson here that we can learn from. from what we can learn. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, okay. I just want to put my two cents in. Go ahead. Um, you know, I just I got back from Florida over the weekend, so um, it was so lovely not to zoom into church, but to actually walk into the sanctuary I know. and have service in the sanctuary. I I really felt okay. I'm back and I'm where I should be. And it felt like such a privilege. You know, Zoom is a privilege as well. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I'm very thankful for it because otherwise when I'm out of state, um, like I used to do, I would go to, you know, either one of the churches that, um, you know, my family members down there go, or I had started going to Christ Fellowship, which is one of those mega churches. Mm -hmm. um, but it just once the pandemic came and I was able to actually interface with, with my home church, it really, it felt good. Yeah. I felt like the fish was back in the water. And then when I um, came in on Sunday and I hadn't even been in, in town 24 hours, but it was so good to walk back into my church, my sanctuary not about how many people were in there, but that it was there, it was open and it welcomed me home. It was good to see you. So it's not about the numbers, right. you know, it's about how you feel about being amongst that congregation mm -hmm. and your leadership and the fellowship, you know, what are you getting out of it? Not, oh, you know, we've got a thousand members at my church. Yes. But how faithful are those members? How engaged are those members? How much of it is a social club? I know a lot of really big churches where people go because it's part of their social activity. It has nothing to do with God, Christ, or anything else. So that's just not the way to rate mm. a church just by how many people there are in it. I sang that song, Thank You, Lord, by Walter Hawkins on Sunday. Um, and I mentioned Bishop Flunder. When she started the Fellowship of Affirming Churches, she's had as many as, um, I think, three to 6,000 members in her church out in San Francisco. Um, mm -hmm. And she's moved to Oakland and we had this in-depth conversation and she said to me, she said, you know, Derek, at this point in my career, she said, I think I really just want a congregation of about 300. Mm -hmm. I've had mm -hmm. thousands, I've sung in stadiums, you know, I've sung all around the world. I've done all this stuff. She said, but about 300. 300 mm. that you know, mm -hmm. that you see mm -hmm. that come to worship, that you know their eyes, you know their families. That's really community to me. Yeah. Mm. And that is one of the things I did miss in, you know, going to one of the mega churches down there that I, that I was attending prior to the pandemic. Um, I, it does a lot of good. There are a lot of young families. There's all kinds of activities, which is great because it channels uh, it's a channel for a lot of young people to keep them out of trouble off the streets and, you know, learning how to be volunteers in their community. So it does have its pluses. But mm -hmm. for me, um, they don't know who I am. You know, right. the pastoral uh, uh, folks, they don't really know who the individual is. Mm. It's like, you know, it's it's the same thing. It's three or 4,000 people in there. Yeah. And that changes, you know, constantly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You yeah. know, so there is something, I mean, there's a fit for everybody wherever you, you go. Yeah. You know, yeah, 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 yeah. I, it felt good to be in my home church where people know who I am, where my pastor mm -hmm. knows who I am. Mm-hmm. 
And I think as you get, um, to me, I think as you get older, that's more important. Because then you're missed if you're, you you know, if you're sick or, you know, well, where's Miss So-and-so? I haven't seen her in a while. Maybe we ought to call her. And, you know, that doesn't happen very often in mega churches because they don't, they, they, they can't miss you. They don't see. Mm -hmm. How can they tell? Mm. True. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, well, thank you for sharing that. That is so true. I want to say the opposite is. You have a small enough church that if you do miss a couple, where were you? Uh, I didn't see you. Last <laughs> um, I wasn't feeling well. You weren't there the Sunday before either. So what happened? <laughs> <laughs> I think of that too. It's you, hilarious. You know exactly when you're not there, and they will pick up and say, "Oh, what happened to you today?" <laughs> so you know, there's a there's there's also always a yin and yang. To every see, there's a verse of vice. <laughs> Yeah, that's what Juanita got. She you mm -hmm. know, stopped coming and a couple of the members said, what's wrong with you? How come you haven't been in church? Me, I won't tell you what that answer was, but anyway. Oh, you know I do. You, I know what it is. <laughs> you know what that answer was. <laughs> but anyway. Well, she was wiping the is, dust. Yeah. Well, speaking of wiping the dust off your feet. <laughs> <laughs> right. right. Let's, read, let's read our gospel lesson. Um, and I want you to know that um, in Luke chapter 9, Jesus sends the disciples out. Remember that there's a, there's a section in the pericope where Jesus sends them out. They go out and they come back. They're like, yo, he's like, go clear, get the demons out. Go heal the sick. Don't stay where you're not wanted. You know, come back. And they come back. And um, then there's that situation where somebody brings somebody who has who's possessed, and they're like, "Your your your disciples couldn't do that." She's like, "Bring them over here, you have little faith." But this is different. This is the very next chapter. Jesus creates a mission for seventy people. Ooh. So there are the disciples that go out, and then there are the seventy elders and others that he sends. After this, the Lord appointed 70 others and sent them on ahead of him in pairs to every town and place where he himself intended to go. He said to them, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, ask the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into the harvest. Go on your way. See, I am sending you out like lambs into the midst of wolves. Carry no <clears throat> purse, no bag, no sandals. Greet no one on the road. Whatever house you enter, first say, peace to this house. And if anyone is there who shares in peace, your peace will rest on that person. But if not, it will return to you. Ooh, sorry about, sorry. Ooh, <laughs> remain in the same house, eating and drinking whatever they provide for the laborer deserves to be paid. Do not move about from house to house. Whenever you enter a town, and its people welcome you, eat what is set before you. Cure the sick who are there and say to them, the kingdom of heaven has come near to you. But whenever you enter a town and they do not welcome you, go out into a street and say, even the dust of your town that clings to our feet, we wipe off and protest of you against you. Yet know this, the kingdom of God has come near. Whoever listens to you listens to me, and whoever rejects you rejects me. And whoever rejects me rejects the one who sent me. The 70 returned with joy, saying, Lord, in your name, even the demons submit to us. He said to them, well, I watched Satan fall from heaven like a flash of lightning. See, I have given you the authority to tread on snakes and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing will hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice at this, that the spirits submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Ooh. <laughs> well, go ahead, Jesus. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Down to Jesus. And I love this verse four when it says, greet no one, carry no purse, no bag, no sandal, and greet no one on the road. 
part of this is to show that this might cause delay and it underscores the urgency of the mission. I also like to think of this as a way of saying, carry no purse, no bag, no sandals, and greet no one on the road. Go to these towns. Don't even risk getting robbed. Because <laughs> it's not safe to go out in, in pairs. You know, this might cause a delay, and this is an urgent mission. Give your peace. If it returns, sit there and eat and drink what they provide. And that the provisions that are given to you is that you are the laborers in, of the harvest. So you deserve to be paid. Cure the sick and say, I'm um, who are there and say the kingdom has come near. Even the dust of your town that clings to your feet. This is also interesting because there's always that phenomenon. Um, I think of this when um, I move into a new apartment, I still carry on this tradition that my aunts always told me, my aunt Dot. I always buy a new brain, broom. I never take my old broom with me. Oh, okay. You never bring the old dust of your old house into your new house. <laughs> mm. <laughs> a new broom sweeps clean. That's mm -hmm. right. And my Aunt Dot always would take this verse and align it to that tradition. If the dust from a place that you're trying to get away from clings to you, it's hard to wipe it off in protest, so you have to really work to wipe it off. So you might as well just buy a new broom. But the mm. emphasis here is not on, the emphasis even on the healing and the welcome is like, just, just make sure everybody knows that the kingdom of God is near, whether they welcome you or they don't. Um, so, um, and it distinguishes these instructions from those given in, in um, chapter nine, where he said, take nothing for your journey, no staff, no bread, bag, nor money, not even an extra tunic, whatever house you enter, stay there and leave from there, whether they welcome you or not, you're leaving the town, shake the dust off as your testimony against them. It's different instructions to the 70. But the, re the wonderful thing about the return of the 70, when they say, oh my gosh, even the demons submit to us, Jesus never told them and never promised them that power. In chapter nine, he told them to go and cure and um, cure demons and let the demons submit to you. In chapter nine, in chapter 10, he doesn't give that instruction. And still, because they say that the kingdom of heaven is near and because they're going in the name of Jesus, the demons submit to them. Hmm. But he's warning people. I know you're happy about everything that you've seen and everything that you think that you've done. Remember, you've done all in the name of God. And don't brag and don't rejoice, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Rejoice that your names are written in heaven. I want you all to remember this, that people will say that there are 12 disciples of Jesus. The 12 disciples that Jesus chose and that, that we know, and four of them that were gospels are attributed to their, to their understanding of Christ's mission. Yes, they were chosen, but Jesus blessed all of those who were in his entourage. So much so that he sent 70 out. And when we get to the book of Acts and they're naming a 12th disciple, Paul says, it must be someone who has been with us from the beginning. So that means that all of these folks have been following Christ and he's building up this group of people. So he even has these 70 people go out to do what his 12 did. And God imbues us with that same gift of telling people that the kingdom of heaven is near. So call out the demons, cure the spiritual nature of people's illnesses that you see. Pray unceasingly and know that your names are written in heaven. Amen. And if you do this, Amen. 
God will be blessing you. Yes. Right so now, then. right now, right now. Mm -hmm. And so I Amen. encourage you now and tomorrow morning or whenever you decide to, the next time you get to some water, do a gentle wash. <laughs> right. <laughs> yes. I like that. I like that. God. I like that. Yes. I thank you all for this. All right. Thank you, thank everyone. You. We thank you. Great to do study. Thank you, Reverend Derek. See you later.